Okay, new POV today, point of view for those people that aren't really hip and don't understand cool internet lingo like the internet. He knows, he understands it. Not everyone. Know POV. Okay, I'm going to speak very, very loud today. I'm going to increase the volume on my computer, which I believe does not in effect at all how Zoom picks up my voice. So that was irrelevant. But today we, we, are, we have for the first time um, an elevated POV thanks to um, new technology brought into the Augustine Center from undisclosed sources. Um, the nature of which means I, I can't comment further. Today's lecture is abstract, uh, semicolon, off timeline, all right? So everybody, if you remember from last class, if you've been with us the whole time, we basically finished up the first 16 months of the war. From the Battle of the Frontiers and the opening of the Western Front in August 1914, through the, uh, and then and the kind of simultaneous um, work on the Eastern Front by the Germans, their smashing victory in, at Tannenberg in August of, of 1914, which then uh, leads into all the work in the East. The, the, the big event that we've covered so far in the East, of course, is the Gorlice Parmo Offensive, where the Germans drive back the, um, drive back the Russians. We are moving into, and if you remember from last class, we are moving into really the kind of absolute thick of the war, arguably the most important and perhaps most depressing year of the entire timeline, 1916. But just like a couple lectures ago, when I went off timeline and we interrupted the Battle of the Frontiers and interrupted the Eastern Front to talk about chemical weapons, that kind of thing. Today, we're actually jumping ahead, even though chronologically we've only gotten to December 31st, 1915. We are jumping ahead deep into 1916 to talk about three separate issues. And they are, if you, I don't know how well you can see the board um, from the comfort of your couches at home. But by the way, you're lazy. Get off the couch, please. Um, yeah, oh, lazy boy. No one ever puts that together, that the product is, is mocking you as you have purchased it. Um, and it says, too, that you're not an adult. You're a boy. It's not lazy man or lazy woman. It's lazy boy. If you're a child, get up and get some exercise and take care of yourself. That's important in these troubled times. A new German strategy. What is that about? Then Ireland. And as you see, I put Ireland both in uh, green ink to celebrate my love for the Irish people and also because it's difficult to read, meaning that it fails because Ireland fails in most things. So it both honors the Irish people and mocks them at the same time. Um, where, what did the Irish family? No, never mind. Um, I forgot we're recording, so we can't do jokes when we're recording. Afterwards, <laughs> promise. Uh, <laughs> number three, domestic and then oppo war. What does oppo war mean? What, is, what am I talking about? Opposition. Opposition to, right. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's, he's right again. I don't know why, I don't know how, but he got it. Okay, and then star. Actually, I'm going to talk about the star first, and then what preview for the Allies going into 1916? What's going on with Allies? Well, I showed something to Sophia, and Sophia has this privileged knowledge that no one else has, but they'll receive now. But she got it first, so she wins. And I showed her in purple ink, I wrote on my notes today. 35 points today. So now we're going to cover 35 points stretching over the new German strategy to Ireland to domestic opposition to the war. So, okay, point number one. Point number one. What is the Hindenburg program? They anyone know? What is the Hindenburg program? This is part and parcel. There's two parts to the new German strategy, I'd say. But what is, can anyone define for me what the Hindenburg program, I should say it was, past tense? Anyone know? What does it say? It's total war economy and domestic and force. Okay, so what a perfect, yeah. What is a total war economy? What is that supposed to mean? Now, remember, keep in mind, look, I'm serious. As kind of a guiding light in this class, a helpful paradigm, I think, keep in mind what I said when I promoted this class, especially in first class and at the party beforehand. 
And I said, so much of our modern world was formed by World War One. I. I mean that. You're going to see that, especially with Ireland today. Um, so much of the issues today, despite, remember that paradoxical thing that despite World War One having so many battles, there are just these terrible battles of attrition and there's no clear winners and everyone loses. And it's just a European suicide, as the Pope said at the time, uh, Benedict the uh, XV. Despite all that, despite this kind of stalemate, attrition, trench warfare, where nothing gets accomplished, it seems, except death and destruction, um, out of that um, stasis, a lot of very active, dynamic things that really form our modern world um, are born. How is total war economy one of those things? Someone please help me out. Maria, good morning. We have a new <clears throat> view for the computer today. I told everyone, oh, Maria's not going to like this. <laughs> no, we'll ask, I'll ask, come back later and ask what you think about it. Dave hates it. Dave's angry at you as well. So Dave, no, I was given you the look to see how you react. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Dave. I guess. Well, I didn't know she really was. Anyone want to address the question? Anyone want to be a good student to talk about the topic? I think it has. Oh, uh -oh. go ahead. Uh, please. Honestly, like my guess, it's like total war economy. That's when they a uh, country like channels all of their resources into the war. Give me an example from American history. Perfect. It's right. You're on the right track. What's a great example of total war economy in American history? World War II. Yeah, exactly. Rosie Riveter. Birth of feminism, poor uh, Betty Friedan writes, the feminine mystique. It's like women fighting for equality and, and more rights because we did the work in the factories kind of thing. That's World War II, right? Who's collecting all the scrap? People right. giving out yeah. things they really needed and used. Rationing. Yeah, yeah. Rationing cards. Yep, we're going to talk about that when we get to, when we do a whole lecture on America. Um, I really, I, I love, I love all, the, I love everything about this class, truly. It not sounds cheesy and dumb, like, oh, of course you would, but like, if I do. I love the chronology, but I also like these abstract lectures where we just kind of go on their thematic more than time. And we're going to do a whole lecture on America thematically. And we'll talk about that, right? You're a patriot if you grow like vegetables for the soldiers and you ration your own food and all these kind of the whole steel world. Pennies. Sorry? Steel pennies. Steel pennies. Steel pennies. I'm not familiar with steel pennies. So, so during World War II, it, they, the US couldn't afford to make proper pennies. They needed proper for the war. So, um, they have the pennies from there are like silver colored and really mm -hmm. yeah. I've heard of that, huh? All right. I have some, I think. I you know. think maybe for those few years we could do without I the think penny. Three years <laughs> well, pennies what if, were worth a lot more than pennies. We couldn't do without pennies. Yeah, well, in Wyoming, you're oh. selling stuff for three cents. Well, you got some pennies, you can't break a nickel exactly, right? Right, Maria? Fair point. Fair enough. Um, okay. So a new German strategy. I, so I have a question though. Okay, good. Okay, that's the second part, the total war economy. But one A, <clears throat> why? Considering 1914-15, why do the Germans want a new strategy of any kind? They've been kicking butt, like we said, right? And that sounds so vulgar and dumb and like juvenile, ooh, kicking butt, wow. That's probably the best way to describe it. The Germans have very, very few setbacks. Uh, the, the Battle of the Frontiers is a smashing success minus two things. Minus the Belgian resistance in the beginning, right? That shows the Belgians are not quote unquote chocolate soldiers, but ready to fight for their, their um, patrimony and defend their country. And of course, the battle of the century, which rightfully so, as we mentioned, ad nauseum now, the battle of the Marne, where the French prevent the repeat of 1870-71, save their capital, and uh, prevent German victory from taking place immediately, uh, to use an, uh, an, an anachronism, Blitzkrieg style. Okay, but still, the, the, and the Battle of the Marne isn't exactly a German defeat. They just don't have a total victory. And in the East as well, it's basically one German victory after another. So why would they change strategy? Let me tell you why. Because in 1916, on January 27, 1916, the British introduced the Military Service Act, which calls for conscription, a draft, all right? And so the Germans pretty quickly understand, yes, we are winning on the scoreboard, remember? Almost every battle we've covered, the Germans suffer half of the casualties of the Allies, which is a very good thing, both for uh, on the humanitarian level of saving lives, but also at, on a strategic thing. If every battle we go to, we lose 50,000 men, that's awful, God rest their souls, but our opponents lost 100,000, well, that's a victory for us. And we have better tactics, the Germans say, and we're conquering more land, we, have, we, have, we do, it's true too. If you remember a couple of classes ago, we have much better trenches, the Germans. So some of the trenches done, done by the Russians and the, the French and the British are kind of just like holes in the ground. And the Germans like concrete them out and they have little like studies and they bring in like furniture. I'm dead serious. 
I'm not trying to, you know, overplay the stereotype of like German engineering and stuff, but it's kind of true. Why a new strategy? Because if you remember to the Anglo-German naval race, and if you remember, that's why, that's why those lectures were so important, the kind of formative lectures talking about the background of the war, the Germans felt this pressure of what they called encirclement, that despite our prowess, despite ever since 1871, we've taken over the mantle as the leading world power, you can say innovation, technology, literature, music, the arts, we've taken it from the British, the Pax Britannica has ended, we now are kings of Europe or, or imagining ourselves as such. And hence, as Bulo says in, in 1897, we need our place in the sun, right? We've left, you know, the, the, we've too long just conquered the realms of the heavens and philosophy. Now we demand our, you know, our place in the sun. The Germans have this paranoia of being literally encircled by enemies on both sides. Surprise, surprise, they're right. That's the whole Schlieffen plan point. Defeat the French on the Western front before the backwards Russians can mobilize. And so they're feeling this crunch now. And it's worse when they say, no matter how much success we have, if this thing keeps dragging on, the other guys have more people, and when they conscript their, their when they conscript their citizens, we're no longer fighting a professional army. We're just fighting a mass of people, and if they just keep pouring people in, mm. it's going to break down for us. And in fact, in fact, um, listen to this quote here: uh, what Ludendorff says uh, to Hermann von Kuhl, his chief of staff, and, and Kuhl mentioned this from Ludendorff. This is in September of 1916. Again, this is an abstract lecture meeting. It's not time. We're going to start next class. I believe we do. We're done in the song next class. We're going to start right at the beginning of 1916. This is beyond that. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's instructive. I spoke with Ludendorff alone. We were in agreement that a large-scale positive outcome is no longer possible. We can only hold on and take the best opportunity for peace. We made too many serious errors this year. Well, that's a spoiler because serious errors. What are the errors that were made at we're done? And the song, right? We're going to talk about the next class. So you don't have that information yet. But nonetheless, pretty quickly after striking success in the first two parts, two, two years of the war, the Germans start thinking um, it's going to be now or never. And if this drags on longer and longer, we don't have the manpower. They do. They're conscripting people of all sides. We will be physically overwhelmed. And yet, in the face of that, or I should say perhaps, maybe this is the co condemnation of Falkenheim's policy. Really quickly, Falkenhayn, he's head of the, the German army in the Western Front, right? Who's the super team in the East, the Germans? Who are the heroes of Tannenberg? Despite their victory, this is where the generals slept. Who are these people? That's Eric, it's Ludendorff and Hindenburg. Right, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. Falkenhayn has taken over from my favorite guy, Elmut von Moltke. Every time I say the name, like, hmm, it's like, it's lip snacking good. You know, it's like a taste of the hot chocolate. <laughs> I, I want I, I say this every time. Uh, sorry, I'll say it again. Like I just want like give me an extra creamy von Moltke and marshmallow sometimes. It sounds like a delicious drink, you know. Maria knows what I'm talking about. Why well, many people want to do this drink? Um, no, it's the word South Dakota people. Well, this connection stands. Falkenheim took over for von Moltke after he has a nervous breakdown. God bless him, not being sarcastic. That must have been insanely stressful planning these armies and having a breakdown after all that success. Falkenheim has been in charge of the Western Front. He will be relieved in August of 1916. And Ludendorff, who is this hero, he's the door knocking hero in Belgium, remember? He surrendered the fort, and he's the hero of, of Tannenberg, along with, Hinden, uh, Hindenburg, along with Hindenburg. This is why, eventually, as we get through, through the chronology again, people accuse Eric Ludendorff of being the dictator of Germany, is because he's, by, he's the Napoleon of this war. He's arguably the most talented military mind. He will come in and he's the guy behind pushing this program named for his colleague, named for this great father of the nation, Hindenburg guy. And this is a direct condemnation of information you don't have yet. But I'll tell you now that when 1916 starts, all right, Falkenheim at Verdun, question mark, what's what we're going to talk about tomorrow or next week, I should say. Tomorrow is in the next class, the immediate following class. Falkenheim says, I want to bleed France white. This is stupid. German success up to January 31st, 1950 has depended upon not giving in to the attrition temptation. To saying, again, open field, right? Don't ever do that. Don't send people to die across the field against machine gun fire. It is almost murder in a certain sense when you know the outcome is nothing but attrition. And yet Falkenheim decides for whatever, we'll talk about it in reasons when we go into detail, we're done. This is not today's lecture, that's next class. 
But he decides to do this and his policy backfires. And so by late in the war, as we're getting this Hindenburg program started, um, it's, it, it's the second part of a new strategy relative to the failure of the first. So to answer your question, like, gosh, okay, but we've talked about that stuff. Thanks for all this awesome information. You're welcome, by the way. But I want to know, like, what is the new German strategy? It's two things. It's one, at the start of the war, it's giving into attrition. It's doing, for some unexplicable reason, what, the, what Joffre and the French and what Haig, who's now in command of the British Army, have been doing with the Allies. And, we, and then we'll talk about the reasons why, right? I don't want to say I don't know why. I'll just say let's put off to next class. But it seems kind of dumb because it, to, 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 through 1915, the first 60 months of the war, they weren't doing that. It was very successful. The Germans are definitely winning the war. And this first part of the new German strategy fails so much, they have to implement the second. Thank you, Sophia. It is, like you said, just total war economy, complete war. Let's look at the details of this. I have 35 points here. I've only covered three points. You have 32 points. That's 35 minus three is 32, right? That's good, right? That's confused. Up. No, it's 30, it's 29. You have 29 points left. No, four, never mind. <laughs> okay, point number, point number four. So, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, this is now the fall of 1916. They are implementing this Hindenburg program in response to the failure of doing attrition stuff, in response to the devastating year of Verdun and the Somme and all this kind of stuff. They, in, in, they enact their own conscription law. But you know what's crazy? The people that are going to go into service are from age, from age 16 to 50. Okay. What was the life expectancy for a man in 1914? Does anyone know? And this will tell you how desperate the Germans are. The first part of the Hindenburg program matched the manpower. Total war economy, everyone's going to fight. This is a total war. This is a great war in every uh, ounce of that title. It is a world war, but also is everyone all in type of war. So are you talking life expectancy at birth or life expectancy at that age? I have no idea what that means. That's... It matters. it matters at birth. Okay, yeah. at birth. How, how what was so? So, at the time of a World War II, it was before we had a lot of antibiotics, right. we didn't have nearly as many vaccines, a lot more children died. And before World War II, people who were men at the end of World War II, the um, the death rate for children was quite high. Sure. Growing up. You wouldn't expect all your children to live mm -hmm. to adulthood. And so if you take the um, lifespan at birth averaging in- okay, So eliminate that, Elimin time. eliminate yeah. the children for a second. Just how, how what would be a, what was an old dude at this time? What was, today an old guy is, I think 80, 84 is pretty old, yeah. uh, right? That's, what, what was the 84 years old back then? Uh, I'll give you the answer, 52 years old. Like I don't think 50, that's really well, true. But let's, that's... but let's, but let's, okay. So, so you, you, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that, there were still a lot of 70 and 80 year olds there, but I'm it's, it's that depressed you, by the stat. Okay. That, that if you were a 30 year old man, you would be expected to live a lot older than 54. Okay, how old? Like like the, the same age that we have now. I would say, you know, 65. Yeah, I figured, yeah. yeah look it up. Correct. So look at yeah, so, so, like so I had I had okay, no, thank you for that. That is a good distinction. Seriously, really. Yeah, thank so, you. Look up if you're like 30 years old, how old could you expect to be? Eliminating the thing in 1943? 1914. 1943. I'm sorry, we're talking World War One. I'm just like started thinking, oh World War II. It was 43 failed. that they made the steel pennies, and it was three different locations that uh, made them not three years. Okay. I look bad at thank you. Anyway, no, thanks for that. So, back to World War One. That was like uh let's see, 19. As you're looking at it, we'll come back to you later. If you have Again, a billion things to get through today. Thank you both for, for looking this up. The whole point is, uh, a 50-year-old guy back then was an old dude. That's, their, that's, what, the, that's what the whole point I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. is, uh, it's like today, we're in such desperate straits, we have to conscript 75-year-old men to go fight. Or 65, whatever. Even 50 no, today. Nobody, exactly. Yeah. Exact. Today, where people live together, if you're like, we're going to go fight country X, Get the 50 year old battalion going, you'd be like, What? Like, even like really fit, jacked six pack abs 50 year old, like, that's weird. Yeah, that's like still, that, that, yeah. that's weird. The ideal soldier is like a 25 year old guy or younger, 22, peak, peak condition. 30s are already like, Hey, yeah, they're fit, but like, if you guys like, yeah, we have our elite crack battalion of stormtroopers who are 68 years old, <laughs> it's like, uh, okay, like, you know, no, so this is how desperate the Germans are, right? 
they're, they're saying 50 year olds in 1914, whatever the thing is, that's still freaking old as beep, right? And that's compulsory <laughs> service. In early 1916, the German army has calls up 900,000. Okay. So like, I'll, I'll use a couple of um, personal examples. So two of my- You have 30 three. seconds, 30 seconds, okay. go. 29, 28, go, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so go, 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 go. Yeah, so three of my great grandfathers were World War I vets. Um, and like two of them were like 1921 around this time, 1916. Okay. Um, and one of them lived until he was like 93 years old. Okay. So yeah, basically if you get past certain, a certain point, you're probably going to live hmm. a long time. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my, my grandfather who was Brothers, when when wasn't in World War when because of um, an injury he had earlier. Yeah. But well, but they lived to eighty. Well, know? the eighty great. My great grandfather is still alive. He's one hundred forty six. So I think that. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, at eighty nine. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's one hundred forty seven actually. Hmm. Happy birthday, uh, double double great granddaddy. Happy. Um, What's his name? What's his name? That's none of your business. <laughs> oh, that's his name. Okay, back back then he was, member, he was a member of the No Nothing Party. Okay, he was a member of these nativists. They were very very. He only gave you thirty seconds. They were very bigoted. The No Nothings, right? And they, they their thing was we know nothing about this. His name is none of your business, Jones. Hmm. Like so, someone asked him what his name was. They thought they're being put down. Yeah, he's under forty seven. <laughs> um, he's also got my none of your business, depending upon. No. Was it's that's what the birth certificate has the apostrophe. <laughs> Dominic, thanks. Really, yeah, thanks for confirming that. So you guys are right, but you're both wrong still because wow, a 52 year old guy in 1914, even if he lives to 93, like you're right. Which, which, thank you for the correction. Um, it's a relative thing depending upon the vaccines and like getting through childhood mortality. Uh, I still don't want a 55 year old guy, right, being like a, our country depending upon that. Yeah, we're bringing back this quarterback guy. He's 50. Like Tom Brady's gonna play quarterback. He's 50. Like that's that's cool, I guess. Satchel Paige, baseball player, pitched when he was in his fifties. I don't know. This is, this is devolving into like ageism right now, so we have to bring him back. So, but we're not going to talk about a happy topic. It's a sad topic. I have something from Adolf Hitler for you, who is at the Battle of First Ypres. And the problem, first thing on this on this Hindenburg economy with calling up the recruits, is that we might have another kind of massacre of the innocent situation at First Ypres. Okay, all these kids come out. And so that's how the conscription can go bad in both ways. You can have a bunch of old dudes who perhaps aren't as fit to fight as we want. We have to have the manpower. And you have a bunch of kids who have had no training. So these kids, this is how he explains how this happens here. Um, this is Hitler's own quote, baptism by fire. Uh, in October of 1914, with feverish eyes, each of us was drawn toward faster and faster return fields and hedges till suddenly the fight began, the fight of man against man. But from the distance, the song of a sound met our ears coming nearer and nearer, passing from company to company. And then while death busily, pl busily plunged his hand into our rows, the song reached us all. We were all passed it on. Deutschland, Deutschland, where else in their else. Um, the old German national anthem. Uh, right. Okay. This is a good description of like some of these kids coming out to have nothing but pure patriotism, nothing else. I'm here to fight and die for the fatherland. And I'm going to go German tactic style, just walk into machine gun fire. So the problem with conscription is, if you care about human numbers, we as Catholics all do. Every life is sacred. Everyone is able to die. It was a tragedy for the family. You know, got, hopefully, to were prepared to die. They had gone to confession, etc. All these kind of questions that there aren't aren't talked about, right? Just kind of like, oh yeah, what are these numbers? Stalin famously said, a uh, terrible quote, very appropriate. He's like, one death is a tragedy. Thousands of deaths is a statistic. That's how often we look at. It. Oh, two hundred thousand people died. Whatever it's a number, you know, every death is a tragedy. And there's these thousands, hundreds of thousands of these people when you conscript young kids, like at First Ypres, who just walk into, with no clue what they're doing, they don't even know how to shoot a gun. So when you conscript people, the question is, please note this, remember this, the question of conscription is, the positive side from the general area is, we have more men, more men to fight. The, but then we have quantity, what always goes quantity, right? Do we have the quality? Can we train these people? Are they maybe experienced soldiers, but too old to fight or in good shape, but have no clue what they're doing, right? How do you have the, how do you, you know, arrange that? More part of the work on Hindenburg, uh, the Hindenburg program also passes. This is December of 1916. This is late in the game. The Auxiliary Services Act. 
Okay, 125,000 skilled workers are assigned to the war economy. This is like a planned economy. It was called a command economy at this time. If you're like, hey, how do you get these? How do you get this massive military industrial complex going? Here's a shocking, shocking surprise, surprise. I guess Groshin was right. Uh, everything does come out of pro. I want you to leave this class being like, wow, I really see everything that we saw in the 20th century and everything about like, why does America spend, you know, billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars on our national defense? It's more than like every other country in the world. Well, a lot of this idea is kind of born here. Like everyone should be involved, all people working, the World War II, women, Rosie Riveter, and the factories, that kind of thing. Um, 800,000 workers receive an exemption from conscription because they're conscripted into the war economy. So the idea is like, maybe we're going to sift through and like do 10 push-ups for me. Shoot a gun at a target. Wow, you missed by 65 feet. Okay, uh, you're going to go make stuff in the factory. Maybe, right? I don't even know if there is even that kind of quality control. Like who's a better soldier or not, but you're going to serve Germany. It's either going to be on a battlefield shooting at people and dying, or you're going to make stuff in the factory, right? Whatever it is. But everyone is going to be involved. And it works in some ways. Okay, so the artillery field guns increased from 53,000 to 6,700, 37 to uh, 37,000 to 4,300 heavy guns, the kind of output. Uh, you don't have to know these numbers. Just don't worry about the numbers. Just the production increases. Just note that. But I'm going to give you the negative side. The Hindenburg economy, all people involved, production increases. Germany is all involved in the war, total war. What's the negative side? What who knows the story how Germany loses? What happens at the end? This factors in. <laughs> who gets really exhausted at the end of the war? Really? Who? Germans do. But what, what Germans? You're on the right track. With Germans. Yeah. Well, they're the ones in the home front. They Perfect. Stop. Perfect. Brilliant. Exactly. Why are the people on the home front, as Dominic perfectly said, why are they exhausted and ready for the war to end? Because they haven't stopped to, to have a meal and their food's going to the soldiers and everything's about the soldiers. They're, if you're all in for the war economy, hey, someone has to pay for it, right? Is Congress going to pass this, what, $5 trillion infrastructure plan, right? I hope they do. I hope they don't. And that's up to you to say if it's good or bad, right? I don't care. Biden's awesome. Biden's not awesome. Like I always say a million times, I'm not here to tell you what to think about politics. It's your business. Someone has to pay for it. And again, like whether you hope we do it, it's great, or we don't, like money does not, in fact, though we kind of do, we have a kind of fiat currency, right? Where you kind of just do make up money out of thin air. But it's like things, the, the chickens come home to roost. If you take out enough debt, eventually you have to pay off the debt. If you're putting in so much uh, things to the army in the war, you know, the home front's eventually going to suffer and break. It does. A big reason the Germans lose the war is, above all, to strike up the you know the national anthem, is American heroism and America saving the Allies, which we do. Which we're going to talk a lot. Of. We're going to talk so much about America. You're going to be bored. You're going to your patriotism will drop because you're like at first it increased. Because I, I'm so proud to be an American, but all we're talking about is America. I wish we could talk about like Finland or something. That's the to your attitude later. We'll never talk about Finland because it's a country that is totally irrelevant. No one cares about Finland. And if you're like, oh, well, I want, please clarify your comments about Finland. I'll clarify my comments about Finland. No one cares about Finland. I apologize. No, I don't apologize. That's what I meant to say. I have no apologies at all. We will not be talking about Finland in this class. Ooh, what? We just did, though. We just spent <laughs> 20 seconds talking about Finland. If you put all this information, if you put all this manpower, this effort in the war economy, the home front will eventually suffer, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why I have different socks on Betsy, deal with it. Um, Hindenburg economy, total war. Yeah, so what? That's, what are you going to do about it? What? Sorry. Get more socks. Get different socks. I, I didn't dress like absolute garbage. You know, I today. think we need to get you socks that are attached together by elastic. I think I need to put my hood on. I'm going to try to see how this works for the next slide, for a little bit. This is good. Okay. So, um, total war economy, domestic and forced. What do we mean by forced? Well, unfortunately, the Germans get involved in slave labor, or they want to be. Who do you think they start deporting, especially? Who do you think they start taking away from their lands, the former lands where these people used to have and trying to get them to as well? Go where? Again, surprise, surprise. Go to fund the German war economy. Hey, we don't have enough Germans to work in the war economy. We have to have these people help in the factories. Who are they primarily? The Belgians, right? The Germans in the Western Front. Oh, sure. This is where you can, right, this is where this is where everything works together, right? Where you can uh, just think about the geography of the war. What are all those hundreds of miles the Germans conquered on their way onto Paris being stopped at the Battle of the Marne? 
that successful campaign of the Battle of the Frontiers, what is all the land they've captured? It is in Belgium. That's it's not ridiculous. It's cool. I look like a Benedictine monk. I mean, I'm thinking about constructing um, a sock system for you. You know those um, knees <laughs> little kids that have the string that goes through mm -hmm. the back? You know, little kids. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. Mm. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> or just by all the same socks. Yeah. Yeah. All you black know, that's or all what white. I do for certain people in my family, the male people. I'm not going to lie. Talking about socks, this is so boring. I'm so not interested in talking about socks. <laughs> so it's back to Belgium. <laughs> Thanks, you do that, I'll, I'll wear it. Maybe. Uh, back to, so Belgium is the territory, is the land, okay? And they're gonna start exporting these people, including people that they, they deem quote unquote work shy. During war, you often have to create euphemisms, right? What does work shy mean? You know, it means, hey, you look like you're not doing anything. You're just sitting on the corner smoking a cigarette from, from the factory. The Germans hope to have the Hindenburg War Economy work good, have 20,000 workers per week. Uh, but they only realized a total of about 60,000 deportations, okay? Which is horrible. It's awful, too. My grandfather was one of these people in World War II. Uh, he was sent to these, my, my, my mom's parents are Polish. My grandfather was born in 1937, so he was during World War II. He was a really young kid, and he, him and his family were sent to a farm in Germany. And thank God, I mean, this is just one day of this is terrifying, being displaced from your home wherever you come back. Thank God, compared to the horrible concentration camps and stuff in, in World War II, I think it was of a horrible, evil situation is the best you could hope for. Like he's, they got sent to a farm, his parents had to work the crops or something. Mm -hmm. I, I actually feel bad that I don't know the whole story. I think he was in Germany for a while. And they came up a lifelong kind of dislike of the Germany. It's shocking, right? Um, but so, yeah, like a lot of people, it's like the Hindenburg War economy is this total effort of of increasing, uh, increasing both the amount of people flowing into the armed forces and increasing domestic military material. And also it's actually somewhere where we've conquered a bunch of land. So get Belgians from the West and a lot of Polish workers from the East. Why, why Poles from the East? Why are Poles part of this compulsory labor? Well, again, because what is all that territory the Germans conquered in Gorlice Tarno? That's all modern day Poland is, okay? Okay, uh, Hindenburg later um, denounces uh, the kind of concessions made within the war, war economy to labor unions. Organized labor, is it born during World War I? Am I saying that? No, not, not quite. But a great example of what will become a huge fight in America in the New Deal era through the 1950s that we have labor unions and when the Democratic Party used to care about blue collar workers, hmm. um, you know, a long time ago. Uh, you, have this, um, you have this unionization within the Hindenburg war economy of normal workers fighting for their rights. And surprise, surprise, the new world order elite industrialists don't like it, shocking. They, they just thought, hey, this is great. Hindenburg and Ludendorff make this work on, we just get to make a ton of money and treat people like slaves. We don't like that they actually want rights. Yeah. That's, that, that doesn't happen today, right? We don't have workers who exploit, you know, employers who exploit the workers and treat them like garbage, right? That, that's gone away, thankfully. You know, sadly, it, it may never will. It, it may never go away. You have a lot of things during the like Hindenburg War economy too that's very similar to what happens in America post World War, post Civil War. What happens in America post Civil War? Again, next semester we're having a class in Civil War. Hope all of you will, will, will join me. I feel like I know World War One very good. I know the Civil War like my own name. It's, it's my, it's my, it's my <laughs> own name. You picked the wrong name. I picked the wrong name. I still can't pronounce it. <laughs> Civil War is, is my like it's like if I was a doctor and I'm a neurosurgeon like it's my civil war I know that better than anything else that's my that's my dissertation that's my <clears throat> and we'll talk all next semester about the American Civil War which is the most important event in our history period we still have the reverberations today of that everyone talks about the import of slavery it was the most important issue in the Civil War but you also have this idea of do we have a loose Greek style confederation of states as the South one a confederation or do you have strong centralized power and what one obviously strong centralized power. States rights is crushed, forever associated with racism and slavery and that, which, which is a great, if you're a federalist person and you're like, I want all roads lead to Rome, I want Washington DC to decide everything and provide opponents. That's a great way to, to, to lambast advocates of states' rights. Like, no, you don't want uh, local government that distributes this kind of Catholic policy. You're just a racist or something. So that's very, people, the people weaponize these terms should not be shocking to anyone who watches even like five minutes of political discourse anywhere. This happens in, in Germany too. Germany, which used to be this collection of 16 states, and the, the Bavarians often very proudly believe they're kind of local independence. Now this, this economy is going to centralize everything and really make Berlin, which is already very strong and central, even more so. Let's talk about Ireland. 
All right. Ireland. Background to Ireland. What are we talking about first of all? Where? Let me just tell you this, okay? Look at 2B. On April 24th to April 29th, you have the Easter uprising. I believe that year, Easter was April 23rd, 1916. This is Easter Monday. This is the Easter octave. It was not yet called this then in the church calendar, but the first Sunday after Easter we have now is Divine Mercy Sunday. Thanks to John Paul II. The Rebel Revelations of our Lord to St. Faustina Kowalska were not until 1933 anyways. This is seven years before. So there, there was no Divine Mercy Sunday then. But, but think for the purpose of today's, this is from Easter Monday in the octave to Divine, Divine Mercy Sunday to Easter Friday. Um, hence why it's called the Easter Uprising. The background to this is the Irish don't like being ruled by the British. The British. You have a rebellion in 1798 already, a major uprising against British rule in Ireland. The Irish people have always, um, especially Catholic Ireland, just hate the British. I don't know how to explain the animosity here. It's even worse than like British versus French people on both sides. The Irish just feel like, and to be fair to them, well, what is the ultimate scandal of Ireland when it comes to Ireland vis-a-vis -vis Britain, which makes me actually feel really gross, um, truly. It's maybe not what you think. This is actually a tough question. I don't, I don't ask tough questions. I realize the intelligence quotient in this class is 70s, 80s. So I try to keep the, the question simple. But this is a, a, a difficult question. This one is like requires a 141. Give me the king's rules and the feeding. See, I know I should have known. It's not even close. It's not even close. <laughs> think, uh, think, culturally. <laughs> think culturally. What is really scandalous and awful? Enforcing their Protestantism. That, also, no. I'm very much for enforcing Protestantism. Just um, <laughs> no. Is that does everyone know that, that Irish is a real language? Mm -hmm. The leader of Ireland today was making a joke about he's learning Irish. I know and it's, and it's up speaking it. Good. It, it, but Ireland should be only Irish. Like the fact they speak English is like, yeah, we're slaves of England. It's a joke. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know until recently there was Irish language. So it's like, it that's embarrassing. Yeah. I know I'm saying that, yeah. that, that people associate this Ireland, though they speak English there. They do. Mm -hmm. Ireland has its own language called Irish, but it was so weeded out and stamped out because it's Irish of, Gaelic. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but again, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's, it's seen as like a kitschy, cool party trick kind of thing. I'm telling you, the, the prime minister of, of Ireland today, his name is Leo Vagrakar or something, he's 100% Irish. Dude. Like, he grew up in Ireland this whole time. He doesn't speak Irish. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. You know, what, I, what I'm saying is for all Irish people, I know, but I'm saying this is the, if you want evidence of how controlled Ireland was by Britain, it's that they weren't allowed to speak their own freaking language, right? This is like, can you imagine the president of France uh, being, you know, so anglified? He only speaks English. He's joking. Though. I think French class is fun. It's like cooking. I just learned some words. That is so effing embarrassing. And I'm saying, US and Canada did that to Native it, exactly, exactly. Yes. But, but thank you for proving my point. That's what I'm saying. Bad. It's really bad. And I'm saying that if you ever want evidence of, do the Irish have a right to be pissed at the British? Yes. Because if, a, if a, 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 an opposing power can force you not to speak your own language, hmm. then it's like, that's the ultimate example of colonization. It seems like the Welsh have done a lot better job at retaining keeping their, their language, language, especially in the North. Yeah, see, I mean, that's great. I, I thank God every single day, truly, no joke, that I'm a native English speaker. English is by far the most important language in the world, but it's not even close. Like uh, I've said this before, but if you have you have primary, secondary, and tertiary speakers, yes, more people speak Mandarin Chinese as a primary language. You know, billions of people, obviously, but secondary, tertiary, it's almost nil. Whereas English, it's like six hundred million native speakers, six hundred million secondary, six hundred million tertiary speakers and across the board. Like, there's no question. If you're anywhere in the world, the first English anyone would try, the first language anyone would try to be English, whoever they are, right? Yeah. If you want to be a pilot, you have to speak English. Exactly. So I'm very thankful I speak English. I love English, you know, and it's great. But it's like, that's disgusting. Like, if I was, and if you're an Irish person, you don't speak your own language, it's embarrassing and horrible and just evidence of how completely controlled and demolished your culture has been. Uh, so, anyways, the Irish are always chafing under British rule, rightfully so. In 1914, there's this thing called the Home Rule, Home rule Bill. Which is going to be, you know, we're trying to pass legislation to allow the Irish to, as the definition speaks for itself, be able to rule themselves separate from the um, the interventionism and the kind of adventurism into domestic uh, affairs from London. Why does the Homer Bill get delayed? Shocking, shocking. What happens to delay the Homer Bill? I mean, you're never going to get this. 
World War One, our class, right? It breaks out like, wait, we gotta postpone, they keep postponing. It's kind of like 15 days to fly to the third. They had 15 days to get home early. And it's like, yeah, they're 15. No, we have 15. No, we've got to delay for six more months. Just six more months of lockdown. Um, that kind of thing. Well, the Irish people finally had enough. Okay, so the Easter uprising. Let me read to you the proclamation of the Easter uprising before I read you the narrative. Okay? And by the way, to make this as simple as possible, the Easter uprising is literally, we Irish people want what? Want blank. What, 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 what's the famous uprising in history? What's the most famous uprising? Maybe? Don't think American Revolution, but French. yeah, we want the French Revolution. We want to go out, storm the Bastille, cause chaos in the city. God forbid, it's always part of, you know, guillotine some people, you know, whatever, and fight and then just proclaim the Republic. We want to proclaim the Irish Republic as independent of all associations to the hated British. And that's our goal. And it's a completely failed attempt. It also fails something that'll succeed in this world, which we talk a lot about, which is what? The Russian Revolution. Keep in mind what I talk about today when we talk about Russia a year from now, a year from now in our chronology, maybe three weeks from now in our time. The Russian Revolution, people go out in the streets in February, the Tsar will abdicate in March, and it's a successful revolution. Lenin and the Bolsheviks take over, we know tragically initiate the USSR, which doesn't fall until 1991. That's the that's the, the, the Irish are trying to do. They want a French or Russian revolution that will succeed. It fails epically. Spoiler, in five days, the British crack down and they've won. But, and I'll take you through the whole narrative, but it's a long-term success for the Irish people because it really both cements Irish nationalism. Enough is enough. Ireland should be ruled by Irish people and will lead to a whole host of events, many of them horrifying and tragic. People that, that like grew up in these times know all about the Irish troubles from the 60s until the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. Know about the IRA and the fighting, you know, in Ulster and all that kind of stuff, right? I don't have to talk, tell you about this. The, the U2 song, Bloody Sunday, remember in 1972, Mass for Kabate, all of those things that, we're, that I'll mention, kind of postscript today, take their root, their origin in this great war conflict. Here's the proclamation, read you word for word, guys. People proclaiming this are self styled Irish patriots. Here's what they say to the Irish people. I'm reading it word for word again. Forgive me for being long winded, it's kind of long. Irish men and Irish women, I'm going to stand up for claims. Should be, should be proclaimed standing. In the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland through us summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organized and trained her manhood through secret revolution organizations, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organizations, the Irish volunteers, the Irish citizen army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, now seizes that moment. And supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, strikes in full confidence of victory, we declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever extinguish, be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty six times during the past 300 years. They have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fun fundamental right and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign state. And we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to cause its freedom, its welfare, its exaltation among nations. The Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights, equal opportunities to all its citizens and deserves, declares the resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally. And oblivious to the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which have divided a minority from the majority in the past, until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent national government representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffragies of all her men and women. The provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessing we invoke upon our arms. And we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonor it by cowardice, inhumanity, or rapine. In this supreme hour, the Irish nation must, by its valor and discipline, and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it's called.
And then people were like cheering and stuff, and they're out in Dublin, they're excited. Okay, that's the proclamation. It happens immediately on the first day in on, on um, <clears throat> I will say August, April 24th. April 24th. What was the spoke? Yeah. Uh, was I, it I think it was English. No, I think it was in English. I think they had, they had, they had a, a Gaelic uh, title on top of the um, on top of the kind of proclamation, but that's that's it. But again, you know, actually, I don't know. I would assume English simply for the widest net possible. But a lot of people have been so have been so beaten out of them that these poor Irish men and women who should be able to speak their own language, they should be practice their own Catholic faith. Um, maybe they're like, yeah, I, I, it's great. My Gaelic actually sucks. You know, I just kind of speak it at home, street Gaelic. You know, in the pub, like English is the language. And this is too serious to have anything lost in translation. Maybe I don't know. I would assume that, but uh, if you remind me, I'll try to get back to you. To give, I don't want to give you the wrong information. Uh, the slides I have for you today, I'm going to show you what this looks like. They want a French Revolution. They want a Russian Revolution. They get Paris Commune. Remember Paris Commune? Maria's scanning her brain now. She I got it right there. That's that's the moment. Light bulb on. Remember, and we talked about in 1870 after the Franco-Prussian War. In the lead up to this class, we show the barricades in France knocking down the statues. And pretty soon that Semon Saint Laurent, the bloody league, is just completely crushed. That's what happens. Okay? Please note that the Irish want Russia, which hasn't happened yet, but for our purposes, looking back, they want Russia or they want France, a successful revolution to get Paris Commune, just a failure and a bloody failure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 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 so. Okay. Uh, on the morning of April 24th, here's your narrative. Okay. And by the way, keep this as a general thing. You're going to have uh, fighting in the streets. You're going to have bombardment by artillery. Okay. You're going to have kind of, uh, and, and overall, more than 2,600 people will be wounded and almost 500 killed. And central Dublin will be reduced kind of to a lot of ruin. And I say a lot of ruin, I actually mean that technically. It's not completely raised to the ground, but it's not good. I mean, back, imagine fire <laughs> artillery fire in the city of this, a city center. It's simple enough. And this is all before the war broke out. No, this is 1916. This oh, now, yeah, uh, forgive me. So okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. This is this here. I don't have a date because it relates to here. No, this is 1916. I yes, for, I forgive you. Brian. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I had just the background. The whole reveal is delayed from 1914. This. To be perfectly clear, no, this is really thank you for that clarification. We need that clear. This so is April. during the war, this is happening, yeah. And the not, people who put down the Irish have to go like, fight them, have to go fight the Germans, they're the down. British, right? Yeah, exactly. So right? they're the British are fighting themselves. Yeah. So the British are basically fighting a civil war while fighting the Germans. This is why this war is so devastating, crazy, and so wide reach. Brilliant. April 24th, about 1,200 members of Irish volunteers and citizen army, along with an all women brigade called Kuman Maban. Um, gather in the city center and the British government is taken completely unawares. So shortly before midday, the rebels have seized important parts, is seized important places in central Dublin. Allah 1871 put up these barricades and their goal is to hold uh, Dublin, the, the city center. Their goal is to hold Dublin, withstand whatever backlash will soon come. And if they do that, maybe it'll, maybe it'll work. Maybe we're living through Paris, 1789, storming the Bastille. The proclamation of Ireland is proclaimed. I'm going to read it to you again. Just kidding. Um, they, they, they proclaim it immediately after seizing on the first day, seizing a center, seizing the center of Dublin. They go about next working for the sine qua non of every revolution, meaning without this, you can't have it. The sine qua non of mornings for me often is a cup of coffee. Without a cup of coffee, my morning cannot begin. Without this, you can't have a revolution. What is it? It is the seizing of communications. They need to cut railways, you know, barricades are to do that, to block the British from coming in and restoring order. They also need to seize um, you know, telegraph lines, whatever, shut off that place we're trying to capture from the rest of the world, so to speak, and that'll aid our cause, hopefully. Tuesday and Wednesday, what happens the first day again? Seizing of Central Dublin, go rebels, they're winning, uh, and they read the proclamation. Tuesday and Wednesday, the British pushback comes, and it comes immediately. Okay, I'm basically going to end the whole story, but it's kind of like as, as we begun. Because by Thursday of that week, 16,000 British troops have come into Dublin because the railways were not secured. If you want to know one reason why the Irish rebellion fails, it's not for lack of um, organization. They had a, that 1,200 armed people ready. 
it wasn't for lack of a plan. Seizing the center of a city, I mean, despite the fact bottling yourself up in the middle, that seems okay. That again, that worked in Paris. We're using that as a model. You know, chaos in the capital might might cause the government to, to, to fall or something, right? These are kind of understandable. The barricades, well, again, that seems kind of like whatever. This is the biggest failure. They do not prevent the quick movement of British troops. When this starts right away, the Irish people are able to repel the British, push them out. Uh, when they seize the center of Dublin, the British just flee. It's like, imagine like, you know, people running away from a, a tsunami wave. It's an immediate success, but the British, the Irish have not planned for anything vis-a-vis -vis regrouping. Realizing the British are going to be really pissed that we did this and they're going to try to put it down, we should probably find a way for have our guys by the rail stations, whatever. I think in the Russian Revolution, when we talk about this, that's one of the things that Lenin and those guys do correctly is they seize the means of transport and cut off St. Petersburg. And they have tons of people on their side, anyways. The Russian Revolution is a much different, much more popular support. Nonetheless, that, that's how it gets put down. Do they figure perhaps incorrectly, but that a lot of British are busy? With, no, with I don't think so. So, uh, no, because I'm gonna tell you right now, I have a section here, reaction Dublin Dublin public. It's a true grassroots movement. So a lot of people don't even know. Like what? We're rebelling? Uh go, okay, good. It's against the British. Oh, good, I'm for it. But it was so well planned, so covertly in this sense, a lot of people who were on the side of the rebels didn't even know they're gonna do this. Okay, so they didn't know there wasn't a lot of there was a lack of foresight. If you're like World War One, the whole timeline seems to be a lack of foresight, you're kind of right, sadly. Whether it's British tactics, we cut through the first line when we don't have reinforcements or communications. Lack of forces seems to be a big theme in this war. Hmm. Um, and then, so so by Saturday, the uh, the British, um, the, the Irish have surrendered. What will later on fuel Irish nationalism out of this is that it's seen as a just cause. In fact, when, when some of the leaders are being led to execution, um, one woman says here, imagine it's like the most simple woman you can imagine. A woman maybe who works as a seamstress or something, no political involvement. But they ask her as they're praying these people to be executed. And this is 1917 or next year. Oh, Ma'am, do you support them? Sure, we should. And why wouldn't we? Aren't they our own flesh and blood? There later on becomes this connection to the failed revolt. It's kind of like well, those guys are on the right side of history. They were fighting for Ireland, dying for, for Ireland. And maybe it was impetuous. It wasn't super well planned. How brave, though. And there it's like the Alamo, right? Look at the Alamo. Those guys are heroes. And they're more heroes because they died. People love lost causes. It's a failed thing. Right. Oh, people talk about like romances, right? Like, you know, uh, the, the, the grandmother who's like, you know, a la Titanic style, Jack Dawson. Yeah, I had a great romance. You know, this, this guy, you know, I was 20 years old and he died in, uh, he died in, by an iceberg. And I never forgot him. <laughs> Where am I going with this? This doesn't apply. They wrote, that they wrote many songs and the songs spread through Ireland. Right. And it creates this folk culture of kind of like yeah. domestic resistance. Yeah. Which will bear fruit. Many of the very bloody, horrible, God have mercy for later on. But precisely right. Um, there's also kind of, uh, we don't have enough time to lack of, the lack of time in class, but the Portobello killings, North King Street massacres, the idea of British soldiers, especially the latter one, North King Street massacre at the end of this, April 20th, 29th, British soldiers supposedly busting into houses and just bayoneting people and killing people. Like that the British reaction isn't appropriate. It's not justified that. They look how animalistic, how evil the British are. So it creates all of this kind of long standing resentment. But it also just follows. You know what the British have done to them in the past. Of course, yeah. It's not. It's not. Well, look character. what happened to the Irish. The, the famine, the potato famine, right? Exactly. In so many ways, of like literally like helping them mm. come and starving the Irish people to death, and like this evil, evil kind of calculus. And then back like, to the Cromwellian persecution. Right. You know, like, yeah. it's like mm. there's a lot. The there's a lot of water under this bridge. There's a lot of water under this bridge, right? Well, look at, let's, let's take a quick postscript because Krashen is always saying in this class, World War One impacts modern events. Let me prove it to you right now. So after the war, you have a war for, after the, the Great War, you have the Irish War of Independence, 1919-1921. Fall and, and, and actually in the in the out of the Irish War of Independence, the Anglo-Irish Treaty um, comes out of it, which ends British rule most of all of Ireland. There's this kind of transitional period in the creation of the Irish Free State. Well, that's not a good enough for some people because they, well, they, so they fight the civil war between 1922 and 23, mm. where you have the, this idea, like, which will happen in Ireland, right? You have Catholic Ireland, mainland Ireland, and Northern Ireland, which is, you know, uh, Belfast, which is um, Ulster, which is part of the UK, which is mainly Protestant, which wants to remain in the United Kingdom. There are still Catholics there, too. Sure. But, second class citizens. But that, that's exactly, that is exactly the problem. We're getting to that in a second, right? This, this troubles. 
even though the British lost in a certain sense, the British put down the rebellion, but they, they lose Ireland's gaining towards independence. British people support the uh, they, they support the side that wants to work for a partition of Ireland. So the, the, the true Irish patriots, you could say, who want an integral non-partition Ireland lose the Irish Civil War. You eventually have the Irish Constitution in 1937. The Republic is not formed until 1949. Hmm. But, but this period of the trouble, <clears throat> 60, the 1960s, 1998, the troubles arise because of exactly what Betsy said, is that you have in Ireland, which is still the case today, there's Ireland still partitioned today. You have Ireland and Northern Ireland, mainland Ireland, mainly Catholic. Ireland is, a lot of people say, is going through a huge decristianization phase, sadly. But people are still nominally Catholic in, in normal, normal Ireland, mainland Ireland, while well Ulster is dominantly Protestant. And when you have these troubles often happening in, uh, in Northern Ireland, and, and what are the two sides fighting for? Well, the Irish Catholic side say it's fighting for integration. They want no more Northern Ireland. They want us to be one country. Or the Ulster people are like, no, damn it, never. We're Protestants. We're British. Go Union, right? So the war is this. The World War One is not end. The World War One doesn't end in Ireland in 1998, and it maybe still hasn't ended. Remember the question of the backstop and Brexit and that kind of stuff. It's still going on, right? It's still going on in Ireland. So that's maybe the first best evidence, the first case I made for these class of how long-standing things that begin in World War One are. Right? In some ways, people in Ireland, Northern Ireland, despite the fact, thank God, the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 calmed some tensions. There was really awful stuff with bombings and massacres in the 70s and 80s, the IRA and the Ulster forces, really horrible, horrible stuff, terrible stuff in Ireland. Um, there, there was a joke once that guy was walking through a checkpoint and uh, it, it was, it, you know, this is the kind of like gallows humor of World War I. And they asked a the guy at a checkpoint, like, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? And the guy knows, like, well, I don't know who these people are. It's dark. I have to give the right answer. And uh, if I you know if they're Protestants and Catholic, vice versa, it could be bad for me. They could beat me up or something, you know, or worse, God forbid. Are you a Catholic or Protestant? Oh, neither. I'm an atheist. Are you a Catholic atheist or Protestant atheist? <laughs> you know, like everyone was on some side. Everyone was on some side, you know. And that's the yeah, that's, and that's the whole thing. Okay, last point. Opposition to World War One. What is the general opposition to World War One? We're gonna have more in, in class later on about. Pope Benedict and the kind of Christian pacifism and working for peace treaties, our beau ideal, meaning our ultimate ideal of peace in, in this uh, war, I would argue, we signed a book about him, Blessed Emperor Karl, the last Habsburg monarch. We haven't talked about Austria-Hungary in a long time. So it'll, be, it'll be fun to go back to them later on. Okay, this is not going to surprise me. Opposition to World War I is basically socialists, anarchists, people on the left, Christian pacifists, Canadian and Irish nationalist women's groups, intellectuals, and rural folk. Why rural folk, especially? We know what crazy people like the Marxists and the professors like me, the stupid Irish Tower people, who just said their heads are in the cloud and, well, what day is it? I get why they're just like, well, hey, peace, love, dope, man. Like, but uh, why, why the rural folk? Why are they against the war? It's very, very simple. Explain this to me. They're, all their crops are being taken for the war. And what's worse than that? Brilliant. Their children. They're far more they're, their sons are the ones who died. They're the ones who can script and die on the song, and also their cross kiss song. Yeah, brilliant, mm -hmm. Sophia. Thank you. Excellent. That's it. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Women in church groups tend to be especially anti war. Not surprising at all. But lest you think that all women were anti war, let me tell you about a woman named Frontline Flora. Frontline Flora, Captain Flora Sanders, the only British woman to serve as a frontline soldier in World War I. At the age of 18, mm -hmm. she trained as a stographer in London, and she used like these kind of skills as a secretary. This too is a great, like, this is, a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not mocking, I'm being dead serious, a kind of cool feminism. It's like, look at the secretary thing. Oh, yeah, look, the secretary in the office, just a second class citizen, the, the, like, uh, what's the Don Draper, the um, madman, the guy in the suit walks in, probably makes a sexist comment to the secretary, and she's just beneath him. She used her secretary skills to become basically like a secret agent, traveled to, to Cairo, Egypt, all across the US, France, would go, like, work as a secretary to see the world and stuff. So she, in a, in a sense, used. A secretarial position, which often is looked at as like a non-empowering position to be empowered and see the world. Really cool. She also joined a shooting club. <laughs> she mm. also liked guns a lot. Um, mm. By 1914, she was 30 years old, so 160 by today's standards. And living, and especially by women's standards, who meant men to marry as you know, 19-year-old girls, she was you know 905. She was living at home with her elderly father and her 15-year-old nephew. Um, she was considered by these people to be unladylike because she didn't like to do women things. In fact, her 15-year-old nephew, Dick Sandus, 
which um, considering this quote, maybe he was appropriately named. <laughs> <laughs> she knew nothing about housekeeping, could not care less. Thanks, Dick. About what? Um, alchemy? About housekeeping. Oh, she knew, <laughs> she knew nothing, she knew nothing not about bad. housekeeping, and she liked guns too much. She was not very ladylike. Shame on her. Babe, thanks, Richard. Uh, oh. So, but an opportunity presents itself. On July 28, 1914, she travels to Serbia and fights for the Serbs. And they are like, the literal quote, literal quote from the Serbian general. You ready for this? She's like, at first I was surprised because she was a nurse. She becomes a nurse. She works as a nurse, but pretty soon she's shooting guns. And, and, and. At first I was surprised because she was a nurse and doubted her skills in the French. Then I realized, wow, she is so badass. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> So, from like Flores, <laughs> she rose the rank of captain the Serbian army by in the trip, right? So, like, again, 1920s, hey, all of you feminists, all of you women feminists and male feminists and everyone who loves feminism was all like, oh, yeah, the 1960s women empowerment. The real first feminist decade, and some of it I think is, is bad, like the 1920s. Like, I, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this to be I'm all for like good feminism. Like, my, my wife got her PhD year before I did. I totally think that's so awesome. Women advocate for equal pay and that's i'm all for that but like bad feminism that oh women should be as promiscuous as men and hook up with the whole world you know get every std possible that also happens in the 20s this, this sexual revolution which we think is just like the 60s and then you see like the griswold versus connecticut in 65 that decriminalizes contraception abortion 73 all these things associated with the sexual revolution actually happens in the 20s first in this what Hemingway called the, and not Hemingway, he was part of it la generation perdue, the, the, the lost generation well, the world, world War I happens, so I guess nothing matters. So we just have sex with everyone and get drunk 24 seven. And women who defy the traditional rules of women, who, who they were called flappers, who were like short skirts, went out dancing, getting drunk all night, promiscuous, sadly. A lot of like stuff comes from like, like frontline flora. Well, I guess maybe women didn't have to sit around and just do what their husband said. They can go <laughs> and the that they can do as well, right? But there was healthy feminism in the 1800s. No such thing, sorry. Just kidding. Go, sorry. So, so, so the early feminists were uh, pro respect. Yeah, Seneca, Seneca, Seneca were pro mother. Exactly. The, the Seneca Falls Conference in 1848 right. is one of the early right. examples of like what I would term great feminism. Of course, women should have the right to vote. That's scandalous. Of course, women should be paid equal. Of course, women are just as intelligent as men should have an equal. Yeah, exactly. The good feminism, not the kind of crazy sexual stuff. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Again, like I'm saying, I'm. My wife, I think, and I don't want to speak for her. Maybe I'll bring her in one day, guest speaker. I, she said she's, she's like a Christian feminist. I agree. She's, of course, very pro-women, very traditional in morality. But again, like, you know, uh, got, her, got her degree before I did. We've always, both has always worked, and that's great. It's like, and I, and I love that. I mean, she's totally like a model for me in that sense. And it's like, that's, that's awesome. Like, all the good parts are not the kind of crazy stuff. So I agree with you. But today, it's like, you can't talk about feminism without, it's either like, mm -hmm. And I get it because people want men to hate women and women to hate men. It's either like women have to have every freedom and do all this kind of crazy sexual stuff, or women should just be like complete second class citizens and you know do everything their husband says. There's no balance. That's really sad. Where it's like exactly separate the good every movement, there's the good from the bad, right? Brilliant. Yeah, 19th century feminism, huge fan of it, right? Seneca Falls, like, yeah, I totally agree. All the way. You mentioned flappers. Do you know where just a trivia? Do you know where that comes from? That word? Because guys, yeah, what if this is like the Here we go. Here I want to have like no, the, the cigar. I, I, I can't do like the mobster voice, but like, hey, you know, we're good about it. Like uh, <laughs> guys, guys drinking moonshine in uh, no, no. during in clubs when they became too forward of the women. They were called. They were called. It was called being flat, and they get slapped. No, so the no. flat were slapped, and they had. Yeah, no. No, I don't know. Flapping, That's actually not flapping right. their skirts. I don't know what is that. It's their boots. Their it boots. is. Yeah, they, boots. they had these big kind of like overshoes, so but they wouldn't cinch them up. They were open. They'd be flapping. That's cool. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Right. And there is this idea that like being fast and loose, and those words have very loaded mm -hmm. meanings. But I mean, you don't have to even take that that extent. Just kind of like the idea of motion and party and fun. Like, right. Right. The dance. Exactly. This is only exacerbated by prohibition in twenty. It's illegal, so I want to do even more. Right. Like, can I have alcohol? Great. Uh, speaking of moonshine, uh, who likes Kenny Chesney? I don't like Kenny Chesney, country singer. Kenny Chesney has a song called "Back Where I Come From." It is so bleeping redneck. I love that's a great song. I think it's about him in East Tennessee. But he has the best line ever. It's where, like, that is country music is poetry in this moment. He talks about being from a real redneck place in Tennessee. And he's like, uh, 
talks about like creationism and love of God in the song. And his line is, I know who made the moon shine through, right? God, I know who made the moon shine through, and also I know who made the moon shine too. The <laughs> <laughs> is so great because we know that God made the moon, but also the hillbilly guy you know, right. makes moon shine. <laughs> like, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it for you in a second. Um, we're gonna finish, we're gonna finish the change. I'm serious. All you people on Zoom. Sorry, I, I flip you off, but I just I can't censor where it gets like blurry and stuff. Otherwise, well, I'll put in the censors later. There. Um, just the, hey, for the real censor, I'm just doing this. This is like double power of and, and empowering people. <laughs> what about other passages? Well, Henry Ford believes capitalism will conquer the world. Well, that idea comes out of World War One, maybe. We should all be peaceful and constant perpetual peace because capitalism will save our don't fight, just make money. He organizes a peace ship. Unfortunately, people get influenza on it and completely fails. When was capitalism as a term actually? Yeah, just as, as tough to pin down now as before. He would just mean like people shouldn't fight, they should have uh, business intercourse, people should have, you know, everything should be tied together. And if, if my economic well being depends upon yours and free market, everyone wins. That was his idea. Woodrow Wilson makes a very kind of a, a comment straight out of Planned Parenthood. Uh -huh. Dead serious. When he taught, well, I often hear Planned Parenthood of people who are pro abortion say, Actually, if you are for supporting Planned Parenthood, you, you're, you're, you're pro life. Because if you have safe abortions, there'll be less abortions, right? And then I hear Catholics that when they roll their eyes and get stuck in the back of their heads. So you're saying more abortion equals less? I don't get it. It sounds like that's false. Yeah. Wilson here, in trying to convince people not to pass this, says the most anti war thing you could do is to be super pro war. Because if you end the war, then there'll be no more wars. So I'm a pacifist, and you're like, actually, if you want to be real pacifist, be even more war than I am. Okay, buddy. Like the word and no words. Yes, ma'am. But I was thinking of this, just what you're talking about now, when you're talking about the total war economy, et cetera. You look at our modern times, and we have the military, and we're sort of divorced from all of that. And it lingers and lingers and lingers. And look how long we've been in Afghanistan, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's not us. That's the soldiers. Yeah, right. We can, so we can compartmentalize and separate. Wait, well, I think that's part of it, certainly. But, but what I'm saying is if we were all in, we would all want out versus just tolerating whatever. Sure, sure, sure. Page three. That's some high school thing you can go do that dirty work that I don't want to change. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, a last point. Uh, one of the most famous Catholic pastors, this guy named Benjamin Salmon. He gets a lot of crap. Even bishops denounce him as a coward. He's an ultimate pacifist. He goes to jail, like Eugene Debs, a famous socialist, is jailed for sedition, apparently. Salmon spends a lot of time in jail because he will not fight. Um, and he becomes a modern inspiration for people like Father Daniel Berrigan, Jesuit priest, God rest of the recently was a big anti-nuclear war activist. Listen to what, this is the last quote. Salmon writes a letter to President Wilson. Benjamin Salmon is a Catholic guy who's a conscientious objector saying, I will not fight in the war. Here's what he says. Regardless of nationality, all men are brothers. God is our Father who art in heaven. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, is unconditional and inexorable. The lowly Nazarene taught us the doctrine of non-resistance, and so convinced was he of the soundness of the doctrine that he sealed his belief of death on the cross. When human law conflicts with divine law, my duty is clear. Conscience, my infallible guide, impels me to tell you that prison, death, or both are infinitely preferable to joining any branch of the army. You know, it's like, however you feel about that, the guy definitely stuck to his guns. And he, yeah, he was a conscious objector. There's a lot. Don't just get the first two years of the war. Everyone is pro-war. It's not the case. Uh, Ireland. That's all I have for you today. Ten slides. I'm going to finish the class. So what was that? Was that the revolution? I think those are the revolutionary guys who seized the thing and are fighting back the British, the British attacks against them. Here are pictures from Dublin itself. That's a great, very sad mm. picture. Just what, you know, what artillery fire, when the British bring in the 16,000 men and reduce the speed of rebel, does to a place. Mm. Who's the story with that? You know, who are those guys? I don't know. Prisoner guy. It looks like a prisoner. Or maybe the in general. Mm -hmm. the yeah, mm -hmm. they're all the same. Mm -hmm. This is cool here. We serve neither King nor Kaiser, but Ireland, right? This, this, this is real outgrowth of Irish patriotism. Mm -hmm. They're British soldiers. Here is this is very interesting. I'm going to finish here on this as I wrap everything up. It says here basically it's a kind of parody article that it imagines like what if Germany wins the war? And they make the British live under German rule, and that every German person in the war, every British person when the war begins is like, we can't have the Germans rule us, they'll be tyrants. 
And they're like, oh, they'll be tyrants, right? And they see here like, uh, England would be constantly irritated by the lofty moral utterances of German statesmen who would assert quite sincerely, no doubt, that England was free, freer than she had ever been before. They're mocking what the British say to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, you Irish don't like us ruling you? No, Ireland is freer than ever when Britain rules. It's really good for you to have British rule. Like, oh, that, that's what the Germans would say. It's really good that you guys are being Germanified. You guys are freer than ever. So, okay. Mm -hmm. um, as I quit this, I'm going to, I have to go order a coffee again. I'm not going to lose my wife. And then I have to go to a meeting. And that's how I'm going to sign off. Did we miss one of your funny things at the beginning? You did. You did.